Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome back to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Today we have Neil Bond and Michael Beam. They're farmers in Clinton County, and they're here to talk to us a little bit about how harvest is going this year. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Glad you guys can be here. Happy to be here. Um, so let's start off with probably the biggest thing people are wondering, how much have you gotten done so far? It's been a little bit challenging with the wet weather, but it's finally drying up a little bit. Corn, we're about, I'd say, 20% complete. Uh, beans, five maybe. We just started over the weekend, okay. and we're still having trouble with finding uh, beans that are actually ready to run. A lot of green stems, green pods, and we even have a little bit of issue with some late weeds that came in, which is slowing, getting ready down. So finding beans that are ready is still a struggle for us. Uh, we got started a little bit earlier on corn. We started running corn when it got 27, 26, 27%. Um, so we're about 60% done on corn. Uh, most corn we've run here just, uh, well, yesterday was was actually down around 18 or 19. So, so things are dropping pretty fast. Um, Bean-wise, we haven't, haven't run any beans. Uh, uh, Probably after this next rain comes in and moves through, then then we'll definitely, I think the beans will be ready, just kind of like what Michael was saying. There's still a lot of green stems and and uh, leaves on some of the beans we have. So Everything was moving really quick with the heat, but it's cooled off a little bit, so everything's back down to what is probably a normal pace. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as, as far as yields go, you don't have to throw out any numbers if you don't want to, but... I know there was a lot of skepticism as to whether the crop this year was as good as what what USDA and what some of these crop tours were saying they are. How do you guys feel so far? I think right now, um, I don't think we'll be quite as good as what we were last year. Um, where we have sprayed fungicide, uh, we've gotten comparable yields, maybe in some instances a little bit better yields than last year, but we always leave some unsprayed uh, just so we have some comparisons and sometimes in the lighter dirt and in the um, uh, areas where we did not have a tassel application of fungicide um, seeing the yields dip below from where they were last year and uh, still good yields but but nothing like last year in those areas so I think overall our average is probably going to be a, a, a little bit lower than what it was last year it's still really hard to tell. Uh, Northwest Clinton County, I think, has been a pretty decent spot, but the yields are ex <clears throat> excuse me, extremely variable. Uh, some places we've run have been some of the highest we've ever seen, and then some of it's been disappointing. But the weather has been just so unpredictable, and it changes such a large amount just from, I mean, township to township. Uh, you know, we'll, through the summer we'd get, you know, one area would get an inch of rain and then just you talk to a guy about two miles down the road, he didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing reports, I mean, more than like 60, 75 bushel swings from just a couple miles difference. Uh, Southern Greene County, just below Xenia, we noticed in some, we just got running some corn up there and it's off just shy of 50 bushels from what Northern Clinton County is. It was, it had to pollinate when it was very dry and all pineappled up. So there's some hills up there that didn't even get pollinated and doesn't take too many zeros out there to bring the average down. The beans, I really don't have a handle on it. We've only ran just, just a small amount. I've seen 10 bushel the acre. I've seen 100 bushel the acre beans in a few spots, but haven't run enough to really get a handle on what yields are doing. So you mentioned some differences in corn there. Are you guys seeing it related, any trends with planting date or maturity group, anything like that? Uh, this year is a year, from what I'm seeing, that the basics are paying off. If you waited till it was dry to plant or waited till it was dry to work the ground, it, it worked, it paid off. You didn't get away with going out there and planting wet or planting shallow because we were wet and we got really dry. So if you were planting into, you know, dry clods, you had sometimes 
two, three, and even four different emergent states, which just hurt yields crazy. And then nitrogen, uh, you know, we need, we're showing a very positive benefits to a luxury of nitrogen early, but also the same benefit to not letting it run out late. Uh, fungicides, fungicides appear to be, you know, paying just pretty much right down the line. Uh, maturities on corn, it's sort of the same trend that I've been seeing in my area for the past several years. Longer is better. You may get some areas where the shorter will keep up, but uh, you move longer into the maturity. Yes, it's going to be wetter, but the yields seem to consistently be higher. Okay. Neil? I agree with what Michael was saying. And one thing we have noticed, there's a, there haven't been very many plots come off, but um, I know that the few that I have seen in our own plots, uh, I noticed that the the top hybrids in those plots, and these weren't sprayed with fungicide, were the ones that had the best disease tolerance. Um, we did have an 108 day corn, and it was like, kind of like Michael says, usually you don't see those earlier corns compete yield wise with, with the later season maturity corns, but this one has been at the top of at least the first two plots that come in, and I think the uh, disease uh, resistance on that is is one of the reasons why we're seeing it this year. So you guys both do on-farm research trials. Do you have a favorite one so far from this year? Well, yours, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't supposed to give the canned answer. <laughs> oh. uh, well, that's a tough question. I've been talked into doing way too many. I don't know if there's really an actual favorite. We've only just just ran, I don't know, maybe two of the, I don't even want to count how many I've got out there done. Uh, there are, I'm really interested in the nitrogen ones because we did a couple different approaches on them. And I really want to see how the numbers play out in the end on it. That's, I'd say that's about my favorite one along with a few nitrogen by population trials that did also. We've, we've done a few um, with two different hybrids of nitrogen by population. In, in the early results, without crunching a lot, or without having time to crunch a lot of the numbers, <clears throat> we planted 30, 35, 40, and 45,000. And then we, we came back in and we did 200 pounds, 250, 300, and 350 pounds of nitrogen and replicated that uh, four times. and. Uh, Basically, right now it looks like that the 35 at 250 is the may not be the highest yielding, but it is the. There's not that much difference in the other one, so it's probably mm -hmm. going to be the most economical. Going back to some of the things that you were talking about earlier, the other nitrogen trial or whatever is what we did with OSU and, and you, Elizabeth, was uh, the timing trials, and um, I can't remember the results right now, but it looked like the V6. Uh, application, split application was probably uh, the one that, that would have won the plot as far as the timing goes. But we also didn't get the late application on until tassel. We'd like to have had it on maybe around V12. Because of the wet weather, we weren't able to get in there, so we had to delay that to, uh, um, to, to the tassel time. So it's probably hurt a little bit from that long of a delay. Uh, <clears throat> nitrogen is going to be a big deal. That is one thing I, I did hear from a grower the other day that he was noticing as much as a hundred bushel difference between where he had tile and he didn't have tile oh, in wow. one particular field. Uh, you know, there could be some other issues there, but uh, with the late, with a lot of the late rains, uh, like Michael said, we were probably losing some nitrogen there later in the season, and, and that's probably affected some of these crops. Yeah, I'd like to expand on that a little bit. Uh, I, I'm i really interested to, with the overall fields and also the trials to pull in, you know, because we had a, a rainfall sensor in one of the plots, but to see how that ties in with, uh, well, one, drainage across the farms, and two, we were running um, smart firmers this year, and I'd like and it looks like there's a very close correlation to organic matter, I mean almost to the line, and see how that uh, is going to work out across different nitrogen rates and also different rainfall amounts. That's one thing 
I haven't really dug into your data yet, but it was so fascinating with that zero nitrogen strip. I know no one likes putting up that out mm -hmm. there, but it's so fascinating to look at the difference of what corn can achieve without nitrogen, depending on the field topography, mm -hmm. the organic matter, especially. I think that that zero rate, the variation across that in yours, Michael, lined up nearly identically with the smart firmer information. Yeah, you were accusing me of uh, doing some extra <laughs> nitrogen because there were some spots that I was getting close to 170 and there's just yeah there was just one little what about 50 foot wide strip of what three percent organic matter just went right through the zero strip yeah. and I mean it just lined up perfect I mean everything was what sub 100 bushel except for that one little spot there where it just climbed yeah, pretty and wild. We, we saw the same thing in your field when we were driving through that zero strip the variation in there correct is amazing yeah I mean it it's hard to believe that you can grow 180 bushel corn without any <laughs> nitrogen but granted it's only in a small strip and like you said it's probably tied closely to the organic matter yeah so. but I, I know I've already started talking to, to you Michael I'm probably gonna try to talk you into it too Neil trying to do some variable rate nitrogen trials and see if we can start leveraging that kind of information yes I think it will really work, especially now that we have an ability to really narrow down the organic matter zones instead of just guessing based off Sergo data that we can actually get it because that's, and that yield changed really fast. I mean, it didn't slowly climb up to, you know, that 180. I mean, it went from 80 to 180 just like that. So you, if we're going to start playing with that, we need to be right on the line to get good data and not start drifting in and out of that yeah I think there's a lot of opportunity there <clears throat> so you guys are both really into on-farm research um, I know sometimes it can be a pain take a little bit more time but you've seen a benefit in doing some of the trials or? absolutely it's I mean it's it's kind of I've always been you know they're not making any more land and it's getting harder to compete to get you know, and so you're going to have to do better with what you got. And I mean, outside of just trying something yourself, it's really nice to partner with you know someone like Ohio State to work with. You know, help come with better ideas, try it, see how it works on other people's, along with on your own farm. But yeah, it's it's making a difference in how I'm approaching management. So have you guys come across any issues? We've seen some pretty good yields, but I've also heard reports of poor stock quality. Have you had, I've seen some down beans from some storms earlier this year. Have you guys run into anything like that? We haven't run into um, a lot of, of issues with the corn yet. Um, there have been some spots, spots especially where we've, we've pushed the population a little bit in some testing where we had seen some root lodging and I think a lot of that has come from that we got a, a tall stalk out there it's eared high uh, we had Gordon come through dump three inches plus of rain soften those soils up and then we've had you know um, what well, Florence came in and, and, and we had a little bit more rain softening of that soil and and so we've seen uh, some areas where we've seen some root lodging um, I do, luckily we haven't gotten a lot of wind because I mm -hmm. think that the, mm -hmm. I think that these stalks aren't real strong and, um, hopefully we don't get any more wind and, and we won't have any more issues, but that's all I've seen so far. Uh, for the most part, the corn is fairly decent as far as stalk quality. Uh, I, one thing that's sticking out. Uh, places that for whatever they ran out of nitrogen or they just drowned it out stuff that was dead before we got that last you know, it was about a month ago the 90 degree heat wave and then both the hurricanes <clears throat> come through if it was dead and didn't have any life in it that 90 degree heat all that water all that humidity it didn't matter what brand it was that stuff was just rotting and there's stalks in those places there that you can just go through just take your hand and gently brush over and they'll fall over as you can see, they're rotting right at the crown. But overall, I mean, I wouldn't get really worried, but if you have places you know about that, I would be going and looking, maybe moving them up on a priority list. But overall, the corn is standing decent. You know, we do have a little bit of sprouting, you know, little bits of different ear molds, but I don't think there's anything really drastic that I've been seeing. Uh, soybeans, they're standing all right for the most part. 
am seeing a little bit of uh, sprouting still in the pods. Uh, sprouting beans that are even in green pods are seeing. Uh, once we got the combines out, it's not really as bad as what it looks when you're out there scouting. So that's a very, very positive thing. But um, overall, not too bad. I guess the only other thing I would mention uh, for those growers who have non-GMO corn out there, I've probably seen more corn borer damage this year than I have in three or four years. Um, seen that if you so if you're experiencing some dropped ears, I imagine if you pick them up and look in at the bone of the stalk, you're probably going to see a a hole there where the corn borer is going through the shank. So uh, uh, kind of monitor that. Yeah, that's a good point and reminder. Keep an eye on that. So with that outlook over the next couple weeks, I know they're calling for rain here and there. You guys feel pretty confident you're going to be able to find the windows to get this in? One way or another. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get her in. I mean, it's still, it's still early, but that can change in a heartbeat. Uh, I just talked to a couple of customers today. Uh, they started beans, and he said they were cutting ruts out in the field, and I was you know, hard to believe and we're pretty firm, but it just goes back in how, I mean, so much rain this year, but it is so different just from, you know, one mile to the next, how, how everything's been treated. A lot of variability, but all in all, I think still thinks pretty good, still got a, you know, a positive outlook for this harvest. Yeah, sometimes I forget that it's, it's almost the first, just the first of October. I mean, Sometimes the crops look like it should be the middle of late October, yeah. and so uh, you get a little antsy. But I think the weather, at least the long-term forecast right now we're looking at, looks like we'll, we'll have ample opportunity to get things in. Yeah, it tricks you, because I think you've been <clears throat> in the field now for about three weeks, and mm -hmm. it, it is just now October. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> our pace this year is, is good. We, we've noticed on, on the soybeans uh, some sudden death, probably we didn't hardly see any last year, but of course this year we're seeing some of it creep up, I think because of the uh, rains we had in, in late July and in early August, we're seeing the effects of sudden death show up. And um, through our aerial imagery, looking at some of the crop health imagery, you can see where we split some fields and used the Olivo um, fungicide on mm -hmm. and so it'll be interesting to see the pictures look like there should be a substantial difference in yield um, but they don't pay you on pictures they pay <laughs> you on on yield so uh, uh, it'll be I'll be uh, looking forward to getting into those and seeing what maybe some of the differences were yeah. a couple last thoughts uh, the this year corn with the, the hot dry spring we had uh, I have never planted as much no-till for the first time in my life as I did this year, getting some fantastic yields out of no-till. Also with corn, I've never been driven to plant as deep as possible just to find moisture. Uh, never planted corn two and a half inches deep before. Beautiful stands out of it. Actually, the field we did the pot on was almost two and a half inches deep when we planted it. And you know, it had a beautiful stand out of it. Uh, another thing with corn, uh, low populations this year. I mean, on some of the trials where we got plenty of rain on the slope, it does look like it would have paid to go a little bit higher, but it has been amazing in my area how low populations are hanging right in there and also helping with disease resistance on some unsprayed places. Uh, you know, spots, you know, where under 30,000 is hanging right in there, you know, even seeing just a few touches up you know plus 300 uh, so it's doing really well and the same thing with soybeans uh, did a few fields where we did some 30 inch row soybeans to try to help planting along so I used the same planter we did with corn which had the smart firmers on it so I started varying the soybean population according to organic matter by letting the smart firmer take control and just on a whim started you know varying the populations from 150,000 on the worst ground to all the way down to a hundred thousand on the best and I did run one of those fields yesterday 
and I mean, there were places where, I mean, it was holding 80 bushel the acre with just dropping 100,000. Pretty wild yeah. out there. And that's 30 inch rows also. I mean, I don't know if 30 inch rows are right or not, but that's just <laughs> what we did, yeah. you know, for that spot. But it, it's pretty neat how well these beans are doing with a lot less out there than what we're used to. Yeah, I think that's um, going to be really interesting. Elizabeth and the Precision Ag team have these um, population trials um, protocols out so that we can do these trials across the state. And I think that is an area that we need a lot more information on and we're thankfully getting it because a lot of educators are putting these trials out. So it'll be interesting to see in e-fields this year what those um, results are. And I think with the current economic situation, if we can put less seed in the ground, um, maybe we can make our bottom line look a little bit better too. Yeah, I'm very forward, looking forward to seeing the results of that. Well, and I think we're going to have to kick you guys out so I can get to work. Well, thank you guys so much. I know that you're probably both antsy to get back in the field. The sun is shining, and we had a great drying weekend. So I'm sure you're antsy. So thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with us today. Well, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Now that we've heard how things are going in Southwest Ohio, let's talk a little bit about harvest progress around the rest of the state. According to Monday's USDA crop progress report, corn harvest is moving along with 11% of the crop in. We're off to a faster start compared to last year when we were only 7% harvested. And our progress is pretty typical with the five year average from this time of year being about 10% completed. Soybean harvest, on the other hand, appears to have been more impacted by the recent wet weather. 15% of the soybean crop is in, which is behind both last year's and the five-year average pace, which are 21% and 19% respectively. Hopefully the wet weather in the forecast doesn't impede your harvest progress and you move right along with a safe harvest season. And I want to take this time to remind everyone that fertilizer application records do need to be documented within 24 hours of the application. So keep that in mind as we get into fertilizer application this fall. You do need to keep those for three years if you're a certified applicator and Again, anyone applying fertilizer to 50 acres or more must be certified in Ohio. So we're going to have some applicator certification trainings coming this winter. You can also take the exam um, at ODA in Reynoldsburg there if you don't want to sit through the three-hour training. Those records um, are a little bit extensive in what they need to have on them. Of course, the name of the fertilizer certificate holder, date of application. You also need to make note of things like soil condition at the time of application, temperature, precipitation, other weather conditions, was the ground frozen or snow covered, and you need to have a weather forecast for the day following the application. So you can get those at NOAA.gov. Um, all of this is listed at nutrienteducation.osu.edu forward slash record keeping. And there are some templates provided there in Excel and PDF format. There's no required format, but if you're looking for something already made up, go ahead and check that out. There's also a link to a record keeping app there as well. Uh, just a reminder that there is the Farm Field Application Resource Monitor um, website. That's farm.bpcrc.osu.edu. And I'll put both of those links in the podcast description for you. That is a website where you can monitor fertilizer application conditions. So you can put in a location, it'll give you your 12 and 24 hour precipitation forecasts and help you determine if it will be suitable to apply fertilizer, manure, pesticides 
based on environmental conditions and the regulations around uh, the state, wherever you might be. So check that out if you're looking for a little more detailed forecast. And speaking of weather, we have a quick update on the outlook for October and November for Aaron Wilson, so I will turn it over to him. Hello everyone, this is Aaron Wilson, OSU Extension Climate Specialist, bringing you the outlook for October and November of 2018. Hopefully many of you got to enjoy the beautiful weather we've had here to close out September, and you're interested in, in what's going to happen over the next couple months as we try to finish, finish up harvest here in Ohio. As you know, throughout most of the summer, we've been warmer than average and wetter than average for many areas, except for a couple of small periods in July. And certainly it's been a little bit drier across our northern counties than the southern half of the state. That warm and wet pattern looks to continue throughout October. According to the Climate Prediction Center, the, the next 6 to 10 and even 8 to 14 day outlook uh, contain high probabilities of seeing above average temperatures. Temperatures right now, our daytime highs are averaging in the upper 60s to low 70s, with overnight lows in the mid 40s to low 50s. So we, we should expect temperatures on average to be higher than that guidance. Uh, we see that both in the, the 6 to 10 and also the 8 to 14 day outlooks. As far as precipitation goes, we still see the active pattern over the next couple of weeks. So we'll have series, series of disturbances moving through over every two to three days, uh, bringing rainfall and the chance of thunderstorms even throughout the first week here of October. Looking at the latter half of October after the middle of the month, uh, Climate Prediction Center is indicating perhaps temperatures cooling down a bit, but maintaining that active pattern uh, throughout the end of the month. Going into November, we still expect we have higher, higher probabilities for above average temperatures throughout November, although the guidance for precipitation is a little bit slim, so we really have equal chances of above, below, and near normal precipitation right now. Though if we don't see any major switch or major changes in our long range pattern, uh, that we can expect to see above average precipitation into November as well. Now, something to note for the winter months, December, January, and February coming up, we do expect El Nino uh, to, conditions to continue in the tropical Pacific. For Ohio and the Ohio Valley, that typically means that we're warmer and drier than average. So that's something to note that as we go from fall into winter, I think conditions across Ohio will begin to dry out. So with that, I wanna thank you. A happy harvest and we'll see you soon. We'd like to thank Michael, Neil, and Aaron for joining us today and hope that you have enjoyed this harvest update. We've got some interesting topics planned for the rest of the fall, including an update on trade. We haven't done that in a while. And then we're gonna be looking at water hemp as it continues to invade Western Ohio. So stay tuned and make sure you subscribe to receive our future podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.